Welcome back to part two of four of this introductory presentation to coherence therapy. Now that we've defined some key terms, we're ready to go deeper into some of the core concepts of the theory, as well as some basic principles of what's necessary for deep, permanent change to occur within the brain. In the next section, we'll be looking at four core concepts that are key to the thinking of coherence therapy. The first of these is the concept of symptom coherence. What symptom coherence says is that when I'm presented with a problem or a symptom, rather than thinking, how can I get rid of this or how can I make it go away? I'm going to think, what is it that would make sense of this symptom existing? The fundamental assumption is that if this symptom exists, then there must be at least one or maybe multiple positions of reality from which it's important to have and to maintain the symptom. And that leads to the second implication of symptom coherence, which is that I don't have to do anything to make the symptom go away. If I can tap into the neural networks that hold the meanings or the knowings that make this symptom really important to, to have and to maintain, if I can tap into those and transform those meanings or transform those knowings, the symptom will just cease to have a function and will cease to exist on its own. The second key concept is that of the emotional truth of symptoms. What this refers to is, is the fact that these unconscious positions or knowings or meanings about self or the world that we're looking for, the, these unconscious knowings that make the symptom important to have or to maintain, they're not held in the frontal cortex. The frontal cortex is the part of the brain that's responsible for rational, logical thinking, and it's the part of the brain that we're more identified with on a day-to-day -day basis. But these knowings or these meanings, they're more of a felt sense, uh, emotionally held. Um, they're implicit knowings that are held in the emotional parts of the brain. Um, and although we're more identified with the rational, logical part of our mind on a daily basis, the fact of the matter is that these knowings or meanings in the emotional brain are the primary drivers of our experience and the primary drivers of our behavior um, most of the time. And although they're emotionally held, I want to make it clear that it doesn't mean there's no logic to them. There's actually a very clear and precise logic to these knowings, to these meanings that are held in the emotional brain. The third important concept is that of non-counteractivity. If we use interventions that are counteractive, they, they don't eliminate uh, the original neural networks. They don't eliminate or transform the, the original knowings or meanings um, that the client comes into therapy with. What they do is they create new neural networks and new knowings and meanings that we hope will suppress or somehow override the original ones, but in fact, the original neural network is still there and the original knowings and meanings are not transformed. And of course, the issue with that is that knowings and meanings that aren't transformed, that are merely suppressed, still exist and someday can resurface. The fourth key concept is that this is an experiential process. And I can't uh, emphasize the importance of this enough. Unlike some other forms of therapy, the, the therapist in coherence therapy, the role of the therapist is not to tell the client what their meanings or what their knowings are that make their symptoms necessary to have. There's no process of interpretation where I, the therapist, realize, oh, you have this symptom for this reason, and now I'm going to point that out to you and sort of get you to see it. A lot of times in coherence therapy, I might not know. In fact, most of the time, I probably don't know when a client comes in to see me why they would have a particular uh, symptom. Ten people might come to see me with depression, and each of them might have a completely and totally unique reason for experiencing depression. So rather than coming in in this expert role where I'm going to see the reason and show it to you, what I do is I set up experiences. The therapist in coherence therapy sets up an experience that's designed to help the client bump into the meanings or the knowings that are relevant to this particular symptom for herself. 
we, we create an experiential state. And uh, as this presentation goes on, I'll go into more detail of what that exactly looks like. And in that experiential state, the client bumps into her own knowings or her own meanings for herself. Okay, so in part three of this presentation, we'll be looking at five principles of permanent change. So the first of these is that permanent change never occurs from the anti-symptom position. And the reason for this, of course, is that the anti-symptom anti position is made up of conscious or explicit knowings about the symptom and how it's no good and how it's a bummer to have and how it's causing me suffering. But those aren't what are driving or governing the symptom. Symptoms are, are driven by unconscious or implicit knowings that are held in the limbic system. Their felt sense, their emotional knowings, and they are unconscious at the beginning of therapy. And if we want to actually transform the symptom, if we want to actually eliminate the symptom, we need to fully inhabit and fully integrate an awareness of the pro-symptom position. The next fundamental assumption is that you can't change a position that you're unaware of having. A position can exist for years, for a lifetime, if one is unaware of having it, if one's co not consciously aware of having it. If it's running in the background, in the unconscious mind, it can just go on and on and on without actively bringing one's conscious awareness to it, you're never going to be able to change it. One of the keys to coherence therapy is that just talking about uh, a symptom requiring position in a cognitive way doesn't do the trick. The client has to actually experience the pro-symptom position directly and immediately. In a more interpretive style of therapy, the therapist might even accurately recognize the position that makes the symptom necessary to have and might try to point that out in a talking about or cognitive way to the client. And that might have the effect of increasing the client's intellectual understanding of the situation, but that's not going to transform the meaning or the knowing, and that's not going to eliminate the symptom. The next key concept is that the mind has this incredible capacity to maintain multiple positions, even completely incompatible positions, simultaneously. Again, it can do this for years, or it can do this for an entire lifetime. The way it does it, the trick that the mind uses in order to maintain completely incompatible positions, is that it only allows awareness of one at any given moment. It only activates or uh, allows the client to experience through the lens of one position at any one time. And what it doesn't do is uh, have the client look through both lenses, both incompatible lenses at the same time. Even just when you think about the idea of looking through two incompatible lenses simultaneously, it brings up a feeling of dissonance, and that's what it would do for the mind, as if you were looking through one telescope with your right eye and one telescope with your left eye, both trained on different objects. That would be uncomfortable for the mind to do. But if you just open your right eye and look at one object, and then close the right eye, and then just look at through the left eye and look at the other object, the mind can do that. Okay. So that's what this fifth concept refers to, that when incompatible positions are experientially juxtaposed, the mind has to choose one. It can't stay in that state of dissonance. It's too uncomfortable for the mind. It's forced to make a choice. If it's just experiencing one, no problem. If it's just experiencing the other, no problem. But if both images are juxtaposed simultaneously in the same field of awareness at the same time, the mind is forced to make a choice. This is the primary agent of change in coherence therapy. And what the mind does is it makes the choice that in the end, it's forced, it basically it's forced to make an assessment of which is more true. And it makes the choice in the direction of the one that it knows to be more true and the other is dissolved.
So now you see that when a client comes to us with a particular presenting problem in coherence therapy, the first question that we ask ourselves is, what makes sense of the existence of this symptom? And then we immediately start a process of searching for the emotional truth or emotional logic that makes it necessary for this particular symptom to exist. And of course, we don't do that by interpreting or by talking about what we do. We do it experientially. And what that actually looks like will become clear to you as you watch the video for part three.